Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, with the class today uh, from verse number 12. Um, I think in the last class we completed verse number up to verse number 11. Um, so what I will do is I will repeat the shloka and then I will say the shloka and then maybe you can repeat Prabhuji's and Mataji's can repeat and then we'll proceed. Uh, text number 12. Tasya Sanja Nayan Harsham Kuru Vruddha Pitamaha Imhanadam Vinadhyo Chaihe Shankham Dadma Pratapama Prabhu can repeat Tasya Sanja Nayan Harsham so what do you normally do translation or direct puppet? Puppet, direct. Yeah, translation. Okay, so Robert by Shrabhupada, then Bhishma, the great valiant grandsire of the Guru dynasty, the grandfather of a fighter, drew his conch shell very loudly, making a sound like the roar of an iron, giving the Duryodhana joy. Robert by Shrabhupada, the grandsire of the Guru dynasty, could understand the inner meaning of the heart of his grandson Duryodhana. And out of his natural compassion for him, he tried to cheer him by blowing his conch very loudly, befitting his position as a lion. Indirectly, by the symbolism of the conch he informed his depressed grandson Duryodhana that he had no chance of victory in the battle because the Supreme Lord Krishna was on the other side. But still, it was his duty to conduct the fight, and no pains would be spared in that connection. So uh, here I will go over some points. Okay, there are some deeper meanings inside these uh, uh, shokas. So some of the characteristics of Krishna Dev, it described as Kuru Vruddha. Vruddha means the elderly person. So he is de described as the elderly person of the Kuru dynasty. Pita Maha. So we say Pita. Pita means our father. Pita Mahan is grandfather. So he, he is the grandfather of the uh, Guru dynasty. And why is he still considered as the grandfather? He, he was never married. He never had sons. But he is still considered as the grandfather because he is at the same generation of the grandfather. So he is considered as the grandfather. Uh, Pratap one, he has tremendous courage and power. So one of the um, characteristics which is shown here is Pratap one. Um, also, it's given in the uh, Shastra, the our scripture. Uh, they talk about his valor, his valiant. Uh, he's, he is said to be defeated the Kshatriyas uh, when he abducted the three queens. I'll not go into the details, but he, he had defeated the Kshatriyas. Uh, he, was, he has fought with Lord Parshuram for 27 days. He uh, not only equaled him, but he almost defeated him. And he, he continued, he stopped the fight because he got the message from the sky that he should not kill Parshuram because Parshuram is a Brahmana. So uh, Parshuram is, uh, although he is playing as a role of a Kshatriya in that uh, place, but he is, a, he is also a Brahmana. So he should not kill. So that was, that's why he did not kill Parshuram at that point in time. So this shows his uh, Pratap. No, he is Pratap one. He has so much power and, and courage. Um, also, it's men even though it's not mentioned here in the in the shloka, but he's the person who was maintaining celibacy. Hmm? So even though he is living in a palace, he has you know he, he sees beautiful queens and everybody, but he's still maintaining celibacy. That's a very great thing uh, for a person to do uh, in such an such a place where he's living in a very opulent environment. Now there are certain things which are indicated by the sounding of the conch shell of Vishwamitra. 
So now, if you um, if you recall the previous one, um, Duryodhana is, um, you know, he is glorifying Bhishma Deva in the previous verse. So now it is also a duty of Bhishma Deva to um, to kind of console Duryodhana because Duryodhana is in a very fearful situation. He knows what is the situation right now. He knows it. He is fearful inside. So now um, and and Bhishma Deva and also other uh, of the Acharyas, like you know, Kripacharya and Dronacharya, they know this. Bhishma Deva also knows this. So um, he he wants to remove that fear from Duryodhana's heart. So that's why he sounds the conch in a way that it sounds like a lion, roaring of a lion. So this gives Duryodhana some joy and some, some kind of a satisfaction that, okay, I have a person like Bhishma Deva who is on my side and who would fight the Pandavas. Um, also, blowing of the conch in the war uh, means that a Kshatriya, like all, all the people who are Present there in the, the war, they are all Kshatriyas. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, the blowing of the conch means that, okay, I am in this war now and I am ready to fight the war for my party and I am ready to die in the war, war also hmm? for my party, for my uh, for my side. Uh, this is the meaning of the blowing of the conch also, hmm? that the Kshatriyas are ready to die um, in the war, in the battlefield. In this case, Bhishma, Bhishma Deva is telling to Duryodhana that I am ready to fight for you and I am ready to die for you also. That's the meaning of the culture, blowing of the culture. Uh, there is one more uh, very important uh, meaning of the culture. Conch represents Lord Vishnu. Right? So, Bhishma Deva is blowing the function who represents Lord Vishnu. But Bhishma Deva is also indirectly telling to Duryodhana that this conch represents Lord Vishnu. Uh, Lord Vishnu is an avatar coming from Lord Krishna. So, in in uh, uh, Shrimad Bhagavatam, in first canto, third chapter, verse 28, it is mentioned, like it said, the verse says, Ete chamsa kalaha kumsa krishna su bhagavan swayam. So, this verse, verse number 28, comes after many, many verses before that talks about many, many incarnations of Lord Krishna. So, it talks about Varadev incarnation, Matsya incarnation, Narshimadev incarnation, all those incarnations, Ram incarnation, uh, all these incarnations are talked. And then towards the, this, uh, on this verse 28, uh, it is mentioned that Ete Chamsa Kalha Kumsha, Krishna Su Bhagavan Suhyam. Meaning, what it is meaning is, all these avatars, all these personalities like Narshimadev, Varadev, they are all coming from Lord Krishna. So that's why it says, Ete Chamsa Kara Puncha Krishna Stu Bhagavan Soyam. So Bhishma Dev understands all these things. He knows all these things. So he says that, uh, you know, his blowing of the conscious represents Lord Vishnu. And who is Lord Vishnu as per Srimad Bhagavatam's uh, the words that I, I just quoted? Lord Vishnu is coming as an incarnation of Lord Krishna. He's an avatar of Lord Krishna. So, and where is Lord Krishna standing? He's on the other side of it. He's on the Pandava side. So, Bhishma Deva is telling to Duryodhana that even though I am blowing this conch shell for your joy and indicating to you that you know I will do everything for you, but please remember that this conch shell represents Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu comes from Lord Krishna, and that very Lord Krishna is standing on the other side of our world, and he is going to fight with us. So your destiny is is a is a, is the end of the entire Kuru dynasty. His one sense he is indicating to uh, Duryodhana already. Okay, so uh, there are other things also that which are talked about in the Shastras. So why did uh, Bhishma Dev fought on the side of the Gurus? Even though Bhishma Dev is a, a very advanced devotee of the Lord, he is a very advanced devotee of Lord Krishna, but still he decided to fight on the side of the Karvas and not on the side of the Pandavas. Why is that so? Uh, there are two reasons, two, three reasons for it. One is that he had enjoyed the money of the Kurus. Hmm? Because he was staying uh, in the palaces of the Kurus, he had enjoyed their money. Right? He was utilizing their money. Uh, secondly, he also took a vow to protect the Kurus. So, uh, because of all these things, even though he knows that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality, even though he is the 
he is a devotee of Lord Krishna. Because of these two reasons, he still decided to fight on the side of the Kauravas and not on the side of the Pandavas. Uh, this is the external factor. The internal factor, what what Ashtar has explained, is that it is also Lord's will. It is Lord Krishna's will also. That Bhishma Deva not for, fight on the side of the Pandavas, but on the side of the Kauravas. And through, through this uh, episode, what Lord Krishna wants to tell the entire world is that no matter how big a devotee you are, no matter how big a person you are, no matter how big a Kshatriya you are like a Bhishma Dev, you know, who can fight with uh, Parshuram for 27 days, almost defeated, no matter who you are, if you are on the side of Adharma, you are going to die, you are going to lose. This is what Krishna wanted to show the entire world hmm, through Bhishma Dev and so on. So this is really the internal factor which Ashtar has explained. That's why Vishma uh, uh, fought on the side of the um, was. Tataha Shankasya Bhairyasya Pranava Naka Gomukhaha Sahasaivabhya Hanyanta Sa Shabdas Tumulo Bhava Prabhuji is going to repeat and then Mataji is going to repeat. Bhairyasya Mataji's can recite Mataji's. The translation by Shiva Kumbha. After that, the conches, drums, bugles, trumpets, and horns were all suddenly sounded, and the combined sound was tumultuous. So here you see uh, what it is explaining is um, once the once Bhishma Deva sounded his conch, then his side of the party, right? They, they are also sounding the conscience. So what, what they are doing? Tankasya uh, means all, all the shams, they have been sounded. Various shams are big drums. Big drums. Panava, uh, Nakam, they are small drums uh, and also kettle drums. And Gomukha is the, the, trum, the trumpet, uh, a lot of cows' uh, horns. Uh, so they are saying that this is all they are trying to do. And they, when they are trying to blow all these musical instruments, or all these instruments in the war, uh, they did it so suddenly that the combined sound was very tumultuous, meaning it was like, you know, very loud, but it was not in sync. It was like everybody just doing what, what they want to do, something, something like that, but it was very loud sound. And why they did all these things is because um, the war is not fought for the sake of fighting a war. It's, it's a really a, a very, uh, it's like fought like a sport. So uh, when they want to fight the war, they do all these activities like blowing up the conscience, um, blowing, blowing up all the different kinds of drums. Uh, they want to show that, okay, we are ready to fight this war. And they want to fight the war in a very sporting spirit. It's not that, okay, I have to I fight this war. It's, you know, I don't want to do it and so on. They don't do that way. They do it in a very sporting way. So that's why they uh, sound all these kind of instruments. And um, uh, they also know that he, they may die in the war. They know this. All the Kshatriyas know this. There is a very high chance that they will die in the war. But they are still ready to do this for the sake of their own party. Whether they are on the side of Dharma or Dharma, that is second part. But they want to do this because they want to fight the war. Uh, they also know, as per the Shastra, that if you are fighting a war and if you die, then you go to the heavenly planets. Hmm? This is mentioned in the Shastras. Um, so, for example, if you see, even on our borders, Indian borders, when they uh, army people are fighting, and if they fight and they die, then they go to heaven. This is as per the shastras. Well. 
uh, they, they are fighting under the instructions of somebody, right? They are not taking their own decisions. So if the, uh, like for example, on the Duryodhan side, uh, the Kaurava side, they are fighting, fighting on the side of the Adharma. So they will all die. But because they are fighting in a, because they are fighting under the instructions of Duryodhan, who is the, who is the leader, they will still go to heaven. Okay. And in this case, anyways, they all, they all, but they, they all died by the hands of Lord Krishna. So anyways, they will go to heaven because they, they get the mercy of Lord Krishna. Um, but it's, it said that, okay, I am the, I am a Kshatriya. Uh, I am fighting for my country. Whether it's right or wrong, that's the second thing. But I got instruction from my military man, some some senior guy, to fight the uh, fight for the country. I'll fight for the country, and then when I die, if I die, then I go to heaven. This is for the shastras. So this is how. Uh, so even though all these conch shells and drums are uh, beaten, it's a war, but it felt like a festival. Okay? This is how the Vedic culture is. That whatever we do, we do it in a very grand way. Right? So. So far, um, so far, if you have seen up to this verse 13, uh, we have talked only about the Kaurava, but we have not talked about the real hero of the whole Bhagavad Gita. Right? So now from the next verse, we will talk about the real hero and the, the, the disciple of the real hero or the, or the friend of the real hero. Right? So from verse 14 onward, uh, we will talk about it. Tataha Shweter श्वेतेर हायर युक्ते महति स्वंदने स्थिताव माधवः पाण्डवश्चैव दिव्यो शंखो प्रदत्मतो on the other side both Lord Krishna and Arjuna, stationed on a great chariot drawn by white horses, sounded their transcendental commotion. Right? So, uh, this is the first time Bhagavad Gita, in Bhagavad Gita, so far, Lord Krishna is now taking entry. You know? So, the, you can think of this as a cameraman, you know, he was focusing on the Kaurava side, now he's focusing on Lord Krishna. And, you know, right? Uh, slightly he's moving toward Lord Krishna. And, and this is the first time he's talking about Krishna's energy. Okay, first point we see here is Divya Divya Shankha. You see the last two last line Divya Shankha. So it talks about the Shankha, which is which is shown, which is called as Divya, meaning transcendental. Uh, so far you have not seen any uh, description of the Shankhas Shankhas that were blown by the on the Kaurava side. It was not mentioned anything that it was a Divya Shankha or you know, whatever. But from here onward, we will see that the Shankhas are actually given um, names, first of all, and they are also called as transcendental, meaning they, they are beyond this material world. So this is one thing which is mentioned here. Uh, uh, then it talks about the the um, uh, the chariot also. Shweter hmm? Hayer Yukte. Hayer is the chariot, and Shweter means it's pulled by Shweta, uh, means white horses. Hmm? So now there is also a history of this uh, uh, of this chariot. So who who gave this chariot to Arjuna? There is a history. I'll a little bit describe the history. So it was Agnidev who actually gave this chariot to Arjuna. Uh, how how he gave it? Uh, so once uh, there is a katha that comes in uh, Shastra, it says that Agnidev was actually burning a forest. The forest name was Khandava Forest, and uh, in that forest there was also a snake called uh, Trikshaka. And this snake was uh, ha happens to be a friend of Lord Indra. So when when Lord Indra comes to know about Bhila, he is pained that okay, his friend who is Sakshak uh, is mostly about to get died in the in the forest because of the fire. So Lord Indra is the Indra, uh, he is the demigod of 
rains. Huh? So he starts pouring rains in that forest. So on one side, Agnidev is making the forest burn. On the other side, Lord Indra is pouring water. So, so Agnidev gets a little irritated and, and, and upset that, okay, why, why am I not able to burn the forest? So normally what happens if you if you read the Shastra, anytime a demigod has a problem, they will always go to Lord Brahma. So Agnidev also goes to Lord Brahma and he says, okay, uh, Brahmaji, what should I do in this case? So Brahmaji says, you go to Lord Krishna and Arjuna and ask for help and they will surely help you. So Agnidev then goes to Lord Krishna and Arjuna and Arjuna then he says, okay, I will help you. I will help you in whatever um, activity you want me to help. Uh, but then you have to give me something in return. So he said, give me um, all these weapons and ammunitions and then I'll fight for you also. So uh, then Arjuna helps Agnidev and Agnidev in return gives all the weapons and ammunitions. At the same time, he also gives this chair in return. Uh, so this is the history how, on how um, uh, Arjuna got this chariot. Also, it's, uh, it's mentioned in the Shastras that this chariot uh, can, uh, has the power to actually win all over the world. The three planetary, the three worlds that we talk about. It can go in any direction. And it can burn, uh, win, win in all the three directions or, or the three worlds. So it's mentioned about, uh, so this chariot is not an ordinary chariot. And uh, Arjuna and Krishna are sitting on that chariot right now. Okay. And uh, uh, then if you look at uh, some of the words, it says about uh, Madhava, Pandava Shiva. So Madhava. Um, it's very important. When we read Bhagavad Gita, in all the shlokas, you have to pay attention to the name of Lord Krishna that is used in that shloka. Because Lord Krishna has many, many names. Uh, but uh, the way uh, this Bhagavad Gita goes, the way Vyasadeva has compiled Bhagavad Gita, he picks very appropriate name on that word of Lord Krishna. So here, why Madhava word is used? Madhava means the husband of Madhavi. Madhavi is the goddess of fortune, which is Lakshmiji, right? So Lord Krishna is the husband of Lakshmiji. Um, now, what does this also mean? Goddess of fortune uh, always lives with her husband, right? So she never leaves the husband. So now Krishna is there in the battlefield. He is on the side of Arjuna, or he is on the side of. Although Krishna decides not to fight hmm, because he is the chariot. But still, it, he has a significant significant role to play in the entire war. So he is now on the side side of the Pandava. He is Madhava, who is who is having the wife, who is Lakshmi Devi herself, who is the fortune of uh, she is the goddess of all the fortune. Um, uh, so he has fortune. Uh, Arjuna has fortune on on his side because he has Krishna on his side. Via Lakshmi Ji, he is getting the fortune. And he has Krishna also on his side. And who is Krishna? Krishna is the Supreme Person. So here Madhava word means that Arjuna has both Krishna, who is the Supreme Person, and fortune on his side, which also indicates that he is going to win the war. Even though he has not started the war yet. He, he, in fact, if you, when we read the future verses, they decide not to fight the war. Right? But all these words, they actually are already giving hints in Bhagavad Gita on what uh, the significance of its words applies to uh, uh, on the Pandava side. In the, in the purport, here there is also a mention, Jayasu Pandu Putrana Yesham Chukshe Janardhanaha. Huh? Yeah. Prabhupada is quoting this line. What does that mean? Jayasu Pandu Putrana. So Pandu Putrana here is referring to Arjuna. Jayatu means uh, victory to you. Pandu Putranam Yesham Pakshi Janardhana. Janardhan is one of the names of Lord Krishna. So whoever uh, Lord Krishna is with, that that party or that side is bound to him. Right? So that, that's also one um, one hint that Prabhupada is giving here. Um, and then when we, we talked about Madhavi, right? So in Brahma Samhita, it's mentioned that um, you may not be able to see it, but I'll recite this verse. No? It's in Brahma Samhita, uh, chapter 5, verse 29. It says, Chinta mani prakara tat mashu kalpa vrikshaha laksha gruteshu surabhira vipala yantam 
लक्ष्मी सहस्र भीष्मे even though i am with you i am going to fight for you i will die for you uh, but he is conscious you know he, uh, he conscious represents vishnu right we, we discuss and he is saying that okay vishnu is coming from krishna and krishna himself is standing on the other, other side which means that we are going to die even here if you if you look at this verse sir this verse also indicates the same thing krishna is on this side lakshmi ji is on this side uh, arjuna is now associated with, or, or supported by lakshmi ji and krishna so it indicates that krishna is uh, i mean arjuna is going to win so it's the same conclusion vishma is also saying we are going to die they are going to win and here this shloka also tells that this party the pandavas party is going to win it's the same conclusion which is coming so now here up to here we uh, we saw that uh, vishma has and and the kaurava side they have blown their conscious and uh, verse 14 says now the pandavas are going to blow the conscious in this world we will exactly know what are the names of the conscious of each of the uh, persons on the pandava side so verse 15 goes like this pancha janyam rishi kesho devadattam dhananjaya pandram dadhau mahashankham bhima karma uttarha maybe you can recite uh, translation by shila prabhu lord krishna blew his conscious called pancha janya arjuna blew his the devadatta and bhima the voracious eater and performer of herculean tasks blew his terrific conscious called okay so there are many there are many many points here which which are very important to discuss um, so for example the first line says pancha janyam rishikeshu again as i said in the previous word lord krishna was referred by the name madhava here he is not referred by the name madhava He is referred by a name called Rishi Kesha. So this has very significant meaning. Rishi Kesha, Rishi Kesha means one who is the controller of the senses. So Lord Krishna is the controller of all our senses. All of us are our senses are controlled by Lord Krishna. Okay, so he is control of all of our senses all the time. And here, what what it means here in the in the relation to uh, Arjuna. is that he is going to also control the senses of arjuna so arjuna is going to fight the war he is going to fight the war under the instructions of lord krishna but his entire senses arjuna's entire senses are being are going to be controlled by lord krishna that is what this means that's why the word rishikesh is used here otherwise you could have used the word madhusudana or govinda right but the word rishikesh is used here it's very significant and uh, now uh, this is in relation to arjuna Where, where this verse says, okay, Lord Krishna is going to control his senses, uh, but this also has a learnings for us as well. That our senses are not in our control all the time. So, for example, I am sitting and talking here, right? Uh, I may think, oh, I am controlling my speech, right? Uh, I am speaking, so I am in control. I may think this way, but what if I have a bad throat? Then I cannot speak. so then it means that i don't have control on my senses right it's actually still controlled by lord krishna only and what this also means is that uh, the control that we have on, on our self in our life is actually dependent by our own karma so if we have a certain kind of karma in the past uh, in the past human world or in this human world uh, we will get a certain kind of a body and we will get certain kind of reactions on that body based on that reactions we are able to either control ourselves uh, more or less so for example if a living entity gets a body of a of a dog uh, that dog cannot talk he has no control he can only bark but when a living entity enters into the body of a human then the living entity can sing can talk 
can make all kinds of sounds, hmm? can play mrudanga, can write beautiful things. So it's all dependent on the karma. And based on the karma, we can have some control. Uh, but still, we are still controlled by Lord Krishna because he is the controller for all the senses. That's why he's called Rishikesha. Hmm? Uh, uh, for example, we also see, uh, uh, let's say we somebody can have Parkinson's disease. Hmm? Somebody can have paralysis. Where is the control now? It's gone. So we are not in control. We think that we are in control, but we are actually not in control. Our, nothing in our life is in our control. It's all controlled by Lord Krishna only. And to the extent uh, based on our karma. So this is the reality. We have to understand this reality that I and my life are not controlled by anyone. My senses are not controlled by anyone. This is the reality. This we should understand. And once we understand this, then our spiritual life begins. If we don't understand this, then we are in Ahankar. We say, okay, I am I am doing things. I am a good player. I am a good Mrudanga player. I am a good speaker. I need to be. I am taught. This is all Ahankar. It comes from Ahankar. Uh, then we are going against the reality. Hmm? The reality is, I am the controller. I am controlled by Lord Krishna. My entire body is controlled by Lord Krishna. That is the reality. And that means then I am the servant because he is controlling me. Right? That means that he is the master. If he is controlling me, naturally, our natural constitution position is that I am the servant. Then he has to be the master. The moment we understand this, this becomes the reality. This is the reality. We have to accept this reality. And then this is where the the real uh, spiritual life begins. There is also a, um, a, a statement coming in Shastra which says, Rishi Kesha Rishi Kena Sevati Bhakti Uchate. Rishi Kesha Rishi Kesha Rishi Kena Sevati Bhakti Uchate. Means when we serve the senses of Lord Krishna, that's when we are actually doing bhakti. When we serve our senses, we are in material world. We are serving Maya. When we serve Lord Krishna's senses, or when we serve the devotees of Lord Krishna, then we are doing bhakti. Bhakti Uchate. Okay. Um, we can also understand this an, uh, by an analogy in our uh, life also that we have we as parents, okay, we have two kids, for example. Uh, there's the younger one, there's the older one. The older one now doesn't listen to the parent. The older one says, okay, I will lock the room, I'll do whatever I want. But the younger one still listens to the parent, uh, you know, talks to the parent and so on. So in our real life also, we see that when the elder one doesn't listen to the parent, does whatever he or she wants to do, the parent also takes a back seat. Parent says, okay, you do whatever you want. But the younger one, who is still, you know, okay, coming, take care of me, complete shelter to the parent, the parent also takes care of the younger one, right? In Now, this is a very gross analogy, but when it comes to bhakti, even in bhakti or in the material world, when, when a living entity uh, goes away from Krishna, who is our actual parent, who is our real parent, who is our real beneficiary. When we go away from Krishna, Krishna says, fine, you want to go away, you can go away. Uh, but then he sends us to Mahadevi, or he puts us under this whole karmic chakra. Uh, but when we take shelter of Lord Krishna, as the small baby takes complete shelter of the parent, uh, he, he takes care of us. Right? So that, that, that understanding we should have. And we have to accept that understanding that, okay, I am never the control of anything. Lord Krishna controls everything, which means that I have to serve Lord Krishna and his senses, not my senses. The moment I start serving my senses, I, I get entangled into this material world. So this is what Rishikesha means in context of Arjuna, and it is a lesson for us. Uh, now, uh, Pancha Janya, there is also a little bit of history behind this, that uh, there is a, there was a demon called Pancha Janya, and Lord Krishna actually defeats the demon, and then he takes that... Uh, uh, that demon had a shank uh, and he takes that shank from him. That's why, uh, you know, here it is mentioned that Pancha Janya. But that doesn't mean that the shank was never with Krishna. The shank is always there with Krishna. It's just that when uh, it is because it, uh, the shank, Pancha Janya shank is an eternal associate of Lord Krishna also. Uh, the paraphernalia of Lord Krishna are always eternal associates of Lord Krishna. Uh, so when he is in the spiritual world, that Pancha Janya shank is always there. But when he comes to the material world, when he descends down uh, in the material world, all these associates, they take births somewhere or the other. They take birth to take part in the leelas of Lord Krishna. So this Panchajanesha, uh, uh, the Shank, 
uh, also goes to this demon called Panchajanja. And Lord Krishna fights with him and gets the shun back. Uh, so there, there's a, lot, a little bit of history behind this. And then uh, we see the word called Dhananjaya. So Deva Datta Dhananjaya. Who is Dhananjaya here? Arjuna. Right? We are not using the word Arjuna directly. Again, the name has a significance. Why is he called Dhananjaya? Dhan Anjaya. Dhananjaya means he has victory over wealth. So why this word is used for him is because um, in the past, uh, you know, his elder brother Yudhishthira was performing this Rajasthira Yagya. So uh, Arjuna goes to the north northern region uh, to accumulate some wealth because Rajasthira Yagya is a very costly sacrifice. So he goes and accumulates some wealth successfully, brings it back to his brother, gives it to him so that the sacrifice can be carried successfully. That's why he is called Dhananjaya. Um, this also, um, now this is from the wealth perspective, huh? or like um, uh, from the, the real wealth perspective. But Dhananjaya also means that he has the wealth of spiritual knowledge. Why? Because he is always with Lord Krishna. So he always has the knowledge of uh, spirit, uh, spiritual knowledge. Uh, that's why also he is called Dhananjaya. Means he has the wealth of spiritual knowledge. Um, then we talk about Bhima. So here you see, uh, I mean, the word Bhima is actually not mentioned here. Bhima karma is actually the activity. Uh, bhima means Herculean task, like very heavy task. Bhima karma is an activity of heavy task. And Vruko Daraha. Vruko Daraha here actually means Bhima, Bhima Sage. Uh, why it is called Vruko Daraha? Because uh, Bhima was like a very huge, huge person, huge personality, very huge body, like a giant body. Okay. Uh, so he, because he also has a very high, uh, very big body, you see his Shankar, which is called Pondram, is also called as Maha Shankar. It's not called a small Shankar, Maha Shankar. He actually had a big Shankar. Uh, Pondram is not a small Shankar, it's a very big Shankar. So every word here has very big significance. So Pondram is a Shankar uh, of Bhima, but that Shankar also is Maha Shankar, just like Bhima, who is a very big body person. Right. So, uh, so here, Vrukro Daraha, Daraha means stomach, and uh, and Vrukro means like a giant, giant stomach. So he has a big body. Um, and uh, Bhima Karma, Bhima Karma is somebody who does very, very heavy work, lot of work he does. So now, uh, it, you know, as you may be aware, that Bhima is a very voracious eater also. It's a lot of food. Why? Because he first he has a very big body. Uh, and also, not just that he has a big body and he, that's why he eats, but he does a lot of big work. So Bhima Karma is actually talking about a lot of heavy tasks that he does. So when you have a big body and when you are required to do a lot of work, Herculean work, you need to eat a lot also. So that's why he used to, uh, he used to eat a lot. Uh, uh, and But he used to also do a lot of work. So, for example, in the Lakshagra, it's mentioned in the Shastras that uh, when they were in the Lakshagra, the Lakshagra was burning. He actually took all the Pandavas and uh, Kunti Devi, who is the mother of all the Pandavas, on his shoulder and he ran. So, th this is the kind of body and this is the kind of strength and this is the kind of work he was doing. So, he was that's why he was eating so much food. So, now that doesn't mean that because he is eating so much food, he has no sense control. It doesn't mean that way. If you have a big body and if you are supposed to do a lot of work, then you can eat a lot of food. Some people may have, uh, some people might be eating less food. That doesn't mean that they have more sense control. It just means that they have a small body and they don't require much food. So that's why they are not eating much food. But that does not mean that they have a more sense control. Uh, and Bhima had no sense control. It doesn't mean that way. So, but because he couldn't, he had to do this Bhima Karma, means Herculean tasks, he was requiring to eat a lot of food. And that's why there is a katha which also comes um, that Vyasa Deva, who, who is uh, who compiles this all shastras and so uh, he said he told uh, Bhima and all the Pandavas that you should do ekadashi. And uh, Bhima says I can't do any ekadashi because I have to eat a lot of food because I do a lot of work. So then uh, Vyasa Deva says okay then you do nirjala Pandava ekadashi. That's why that word nirjala Pandava comes. Uh, and on that day. Um, Bhima also does the Ekadashi. That's the one Ekadashi that he does. And uh, the 
the ekadashi has the potency that if you do can't do any ekadashis in the entire year but if you do that one ekadashi which is nirjal means you don't eat anything you don't drink also you don't drink water also then it is counted as you have done all the ekadashis hmm? so this is what uh, there is a history with a bit with uh, with bhima okay so i'll read verse number 16 17 and 18 they are put together uh, ananta vijayam raja kunti putro yudhishthira nakulah महाभाह so uh, here these three verses they um, talk about um, the other two, other two putra putras of uh, kunti devi so nakula and sahadev so they are they are shankha names conscious names are also mentioned here like sugosha and manipushpa hmm? and then it talk the verse talks about who are the other people great personalities on the side of uh uh corvot a little bit uh, discussions are given here um so for example uh, kashyascha hmm? uh, parmeshwasha kashya kashyascha means kashyas means the king of kashi hmm? varanasi and uh, he is the greatest archer is one of the great archer uh, shikhandi cha maharataha so shikhandi uh, maharataha you know the word maharathi maharathi means uh, who can fight with 10000 people at the same time that is what that is what the power of shikhandi was he was such a great warrior uh, and then drushta dumnyu uh, drushta dumnyu or drushta dumnyu uh, he is drupada's son uh, viratascha uh, who gave shelter virat is the king who gave shelter to the pandava for one year right the agyat was was so virat is the person who gave that ಶಕ್ತಿಯಾಗಿಸ್ಟರ್ and here there is one important point um, uh, and sanjay is speaking all these things right to dr rasha so he uses the word called sarvashah prithvi pate hmm? he is referring to dhritarashtra sarvashah prithvi pate so sanjay is in one sense glorifying dhritarashtra by using this term called sarvashah prithvi pate but at the same time he is telling to dhritarashtra that it is because of your bad policies of you wanting to put your son on the throne despite the fact that you doesn't deserve to be sitting on the throne uh, because you are the younger brother of pandu is the elder brother so his son should actually sit on the throne and rule the kingdom because of this bad policy that you are following you will lose the war so in one sense he is glorifying him but at the same time he is also telling him that you are done your pand your karvas are all done they are all going to die and also why because Uh, your your pandava uh, karvas are on the side of adharma and krishna is on the other side so you are going to uh, you, the 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 karvas are going to die they will lose the war uh, then we have the last verse sabhushu dharta rashtra nam rudayani vyadarayat navascha prithvim prithivim cha prithivim chaiva tumulo ya bhannuna dayan so what it means here is um, that after sounding all these conscious on the uh, on the side of the pandavas um, on the side of the karvas their hearts were shattered no it says hridayani vyada rajat means their hearts are shattered on the other side so so far we have seen that even the karvas had sounded the conscious but on the pandava side nothing happened nobody got nobody's heart were shattered nobody was fear uh, fearful oh, how will we win the war and so on 
But when the Pandava sound, sounded all their conscious, on the other side, all their hearts were shattered. They were actually very fearful. Uh, this is what is mentioned here. Um, so, but there is a there is very good learnings in this um, in this uh, work for all of us. It's not just for uh, Arjuna, but for all of us, there are very good learnings here. Uh, so, for example, in in uh, uh, in the eighth chapter, fifteen, where Krishna says uh, the nature of this material world, he says dukha ashashotam and dukha vim. Ashashot means temporary, and Dukhale means it's full of misery, right? So why why do we feel fear? Why why is that uh, the Kauravas are feeling fear, right? Even though they have Kripacharya, Dronacharya, Bhishma, everybody is there. I mean, they are great warriors. But still, Duryodhan and other people in that party also are feeling very fearful, especially Duryodhan. So this also applies to us, that in this material world, we feel very fearful. Why do we feel fearful? Why? Well, where is this fear coming from? So we have many kinds of fear. Hmm? I can lose the job. That's one big fear. Or I can lose my family members. My parents may die. My spouse may die. My children may leave me and go away. Uh, I can get hit by a car. I may die myself. You know, we don't want to die. Or I may lose my positions, my money, my whatever status, name, fame. I can lose all of them. So this fear is there. Constant fear is there. The reason why this fear is there is because we are attached to all these things, but these things are temporary in nature. They are all temporary. So uh, there is a very good analogy of this. Uh, let's say we travel in the train, right? So we are going, so let's say, from Bangalore to say, Delhi. Uh, we, we get into Bangalore train. And then uh, so in every station, you know, every next station, some people are joining the train. And they are coming and sitting next to us. And then we develop some conversations with them. And we develop some sort of a relationship with them. We ask, where are you from? What's your name? What do you do? We also give the same answers to them. And then we develop some kind of a job and relationship with them. Now, when the train is moving ahead and when the destinations are coming, people start getting down. Right? They leave the train. Uh, this is what actually happens in the material world. Nothing is permanent. Everything is temporary. Uh, even in, in our real life also, in our material life also, we will see that we take birth, we'll have parents, we get married, we'll have children, we, we do all the kind of hard work, we'll accumulate positions and everything. But slowly, slowly, as the journey progresses, as our life progresses, we'll see, okay, one person left, left the body. We'll see parents left the body. Maybe the uh, spouse left the body. Maybe the son left the body before the parent. Maybe the child left the body. Uh, some relative left the body. Uh, maybe somebody lost their entire positions. This, all these things are temporary in nature. And because we are attached to these temporary things, they are always in fear. What this verse is saying is that why is why are the Pandavas not in fear? Why only the on the other side, the Karuas are in fear? Because if you see nobody on the uh, Pandava side, their hearts were shattered when the Bhishma blew, blown his uh, conscience. Nobody. What is the reason for it? The reason is because Pandavas are the greatest devotees of the Lord. They know that I am on, Krishna is on my side. Why do I have to worry? Then? And who is Krishna? He is the supreme person. He is the permanent person. He never leaves. All of us will leave each other. We are all temporary, but we are attaching ourselves with each other. Temporary, or things are temporary, lives are temporary, but we are attaching ourselves to temporary things. Krishna also says, Ashashwat and Dukhanya, Ashashwat, temporary. That is the cause of our fear. So the learning that we have here is, we should attach ourselves to Krishna, who is always permanent, who is always there. And in, in Bhagavad Gita, verse 15, chapter, it says, um, um, Sarvasa Cham Hidhi Sani Vishnu. Krishna says this. Sarvasa Cham Hidhi Sani Vishnu. I am present in everybody's heart. Hidhi Sani Vishnu. I am present in everybody. So he is in our heart all the time. Not just in this body. In our next body. Also. If I take a dog's body, he will still be there with, in the dog body also. With my own soul in that animal body. He will also be there. Krishna is always there. My parents, I will leave my parents in this life. Die and take a dog's body maybe in the next life. My parents are left here only. They will also live and go. I will take a, go, a dog's body. I will have a dog parent now. 
then I may get a, a tree body, then I have a tree parent. So all these things are temporary. I am constantly leaving the body. All these people around me are also living. There is only one person who is always with me. Who is that person? Krishna. He is always permanent, always present with me, always helping me, uh, always taking care of me. So who gives this air to me? My parents are not giving this to me. My spouse is not giving this to me. Who gives the uh, who who is giving this uh, you know fruits and vegetables and uh, all this dal chawal? Who is it is coming from the earth? Who is giving the dirt? We are not creating the dirt. It is Krishna who has created all these things. So he is taking care of me from time immemorial. Eternally he is taking care of me. But still we are not going to attach with him. We are going to attach to temporal things. So the lesson here is we should attach to the permanent thing who is always with us, who is our well who is always taking care of us. We should attach to that person and serve that person. So what is the best way to serve that person? Is to know about him through Shastra. And the easiest way is to chant his names. And what is that way? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Rama. Hare Hare. When we do this, we are actually inviting Krishna in our, he is always there in our heart, but we are telling Krishna, I am ready to look at to look at you now. So please, you know, also give me that shelter, give me that blessings. And then, then as you see, we saw in the previous verses, Rishi Kesho, he will actually start taking control of all that. Right now he says, okay, you, you don't want to come to me, right? You want to serve Maya Devi? Okay, you go and serve Maya Devi. Then I'm not controlling you. Maya, they will control you. But the moment we turn towards him and say, Krishna, I'm surrendering to you, he will start controlling our life also. To the extent that everything he will, he will control and you don't have to do, worry about anything. This is the state when you become fearless. Otherwise, we'll always be in fear. This is what is exhibited by uh, the Pandavas. They are never in fear. Why? Because they are always in Krishna. And Krishna is always in fear. So this is all I wanted to share today. Uh, if you have any questions or, or comments, um, we, can, we can discuss it. Yes, um, the karma are not, not fixed. Even though we may have done very bad karmas, if you are in the Maya's hand, the karma will come and hit us. The reactions of the karma. Karma is action. It's, it's the activity that we do. But every action creates a reaction. It may come immediately. It may come after some time. It may come in the next 10 months or so. So, depending on the type of action we are doing. But when we do Krishna's chanting of Krishna's name, uh, that effect of that karma reduces. And Krishna can also remove that karma permanently. Otherwise, karma is always going to be with you. You can never come out of karma. So, uh, that is what is called as, there are three types of karmas. Right? Karma, vikarma and akarma. So, karma is the good pious activities. So, you do good, you get good. The karma is unpious activities. You do bad, you will get bad. A karma is something which is called chanting of the Krishna. That is that karma which does not generate any karma uh, reactions at all. It has no reactions. So we become free from all those reactions. And also the other effect is that all the sins that we have done, I start purging those sins. So the reaction that comes from the sins also is getting reduced. Yes. Yes. No. Uh, no, no. Karma may change if the Lord desires it to change. Because if you take shelter of Lord Krishna, He takes control of your life. Then He can do whatever with your life. Then if there is a bad karma that is pending on you because of some bad, uh, bad reaction, because of some bad karma you may have done in the past, He can remove that. If you are completely certain to Lord Krishna, but if you are not surrendered to Lord Krishna, if you are surrendered to Maya Devi, then the law, the law of karma will continue with you always. Always. So if you do bad, you will get a bad body only. If you keep doing good, now good also means what? Pious activity does not mean good activity. Pious does not mean that. Because pious activity also binds you to this material world. So what is binding? So, if I do a lot of good work, say I open up an anathalaya for people, that's a good work, that's a pious work. So, that there is a result that will come to me only. It will not go to my, my wife. I did the work, my, my wife will not get the result. Only I will get the result. 
So I have to take birth to enjoy the result again. I may not enjoy all the results in this life only. I may not, I may enjoy a little bit, but I have done so much good work that it may come life after life for me. So I may get a human body that time, but I may not get right away. Right away after this body, I'm leaving this body, I opened 100 anathalas. I leave this body and I get a human body, that may not happen. Not, that is not true. I may still go through this 84 uh, million species. We'll get a human body. When I get that human body, then I will enjoy the good karma that I have done in this lifetime. What will happen? I will get born in a wealthy family. That is going to happen because I did good karma. So, but the, the very high chance that in this body, now you are in human body, and in the next birth, you will get a human body. That is possible only if you are doing Krishna Bhakti. Because Krishna will then give you that opportunity, bypass all the Chaurasi uh, body. He will, he will say, I, I will bypass everything for you. I will give you human birth again right away so that you can continue in that Bhakti. Fast, super fast. Otherwise, uh, in Maya's land, you will never get the human body right away. No, it is there in the Shastra. And we have to go through it. We, we have no choice. That's why in Shastra it is also said, right? Uh, the human body is so precious. Why it is said? Because in 8.4 8 million bodies, Chaurasi Kuti body ke baad mein, humko ek manushya body milti hai. Why is it not important? It is very precious. That is one reason. Second reason is, it is only in this human body, I can think, I can ask questions. I can ask, who am I? Who is Supreme Personality? What is my relationship with God? Why did I fall in this material world? These questions I can ask only in the human body. If I, in a dog body, I will only bark. I cannot ask these questions. That is why the human body is very precious. This is given in the Shastras. That's why they say, uh, our Acharyas also say, that give this one life to Krishna. Because in the other lives, you are anyways going to enjoy. There is no other opportunity. Nothing you will do. What is the lion doing? He is enjoying only. He has nothing else to do. He will kill, he will eat the meat, and he will sit and relax. What else he is doing? Nothing. There is nothing. He is really enjoying life. There is no, no, nothing for him. No work for him. No, he doesn't have to work. He doesn't have to pay taxes. He doesn't have to, you know, uh, put his uh, children to school, go through all the hell. He doesn't, he, that is the real enjoyment. If you see, we are actually suffering here. We go through so much pain in life. We think, okay, yeah, we are living luxurious life, whatever. There is God of pain. So, Acharya says, give this one human life to Krishna and make spiritual progress. Then your life is perfect. Otherwise, we are, we are still humans, two-legged humans, uh, two-legged animals. Still animals. Only, but a little bit sophisticated. Living in good houses, you know, doing things in closed doors and so on. They, animals will do things in open, will do it in closed doors. That's the only difference. But our mentality is still the same. So that's why Acharya says, give this one life to Krishna. Know about him, do devotional service, chant Hare Krishna, and make your life perfect. Uh, and there is one more thing, that whatever you put in the spiritual account, it carries to your next human life also. Whatever you put in the material account, it ends here the moment you leave the body. Right? So you learn ABCD, you learn all, everything. In your next life, you will start again from ABCD, A for apple, B for ball. We do, we all do this. But bhakti is not like that. So in this lifetime, in this current body, if I did 5% bhakti in my next human birth, whenever I get it, I will start from 6%. But materially, I will start from 0 only. Materially, whatever ABCD I learned now in this life, I will again have to learn. That is the first part of bhakti. But spiritual life is Krishna's mercy. Whatever you do, he will remember that. And he will say, okay, now from the next human birth, you start from there. And continue. So this is, this is the difference. Karma is very, very tricky. It's very tricky. But if you serve Lord Krishna, he will take care of it. Otherwise, if you serve Maya, then, then we are gone. We will be in this chakra of life and death, life and death, life and death, continuously. And uh, uh, it, it gets very bad also. Like we, we think, okay, I am in this beautiful place. I have no miseries. No, but 
rich people also do a lot of bad things, knowingly or unknowingly. Okay. So I became rich because I did some good work in my previous work. But when I became rich, I started doing bad things. So I will now go down. I'm going down now. My karmas are down, going down. So in my next human birth, I will suffer a lot. That's why this whole, even pious work is not good. Even bad work anyways is not good. What is good is a karma. Means any karma that does not generate any reactions. That is a karma. And the, the, that work is only chanting Krishna's name. Serving Krishna. Because that work does not generate any reactions. It's just karma, but no reactions to it. That is the only way to come out of this cycle of birth and death. Otherwise, we will continue to rot here in this material. There is no end to it. Someday we will become rich. Someday we will become poor. Someday we will get a human, uh, male body. Some janma will get a female body. Some janma will get a dog body. This will continue like this forever. There is no end to it. So how do you come out of this? Only by doing a karma. Karma means devotional service. Because it does not generate any reactions to it. And then whatever previous reactions we have, Lord Krishna will take care of it. He says, uh, in, in verses he says, what is that? Sarva dharman parintachya, maam ikham sharanam rida. Aham sarva, sarva papebhyo. Aham sarva papebhyo. What is that? Moksha shriyami maa suchaha. Aham sarva papebhyo. Means all your papa are going to remove. Do not fear. He says, do not fear. Just surrender. So, all your papa is, he is saying that I will remove your karma. The reactions also are removed. That's why karmas are not fixed. Or the reactions are not fixed. But as long as you are with Krishna. If you go to Maya Devi, then they become very hard also. And fixed also. They will continue like that. 